Thank you for listening to the Limitless Spirit Podcast. This is the conversation about faith, hope, and the impact we're designed to make as Christians on the world around us. Your host, Helen Todd, the Vice President of World Missions Alliance, has spent over two decades traveling to the world's hotspots to meet the spiritual and physical needs of those who are desperate. She interviews guests from different walks of life whose stories, books, and ideas examine today's most pressing issues and challenges of being a Christian today and inspire you to action. Growing up, we used to go roof hopping, you know, where you jump between buildings and sometimes we were running from another group of people trying to beat us up and things like that. Often we would sleep on the fire escape and you know, with all the sirens and noise. And it's very tough, very poor, and little hope of the future. And when you're a minority, you're marginalized. My dad worked three jobs and my mom was mentally ill her whole life. So I grew up never feeling loved, really. Like love was, hey, I'm paying the bills, that's love. Never affection. So you kind of grew up feeling abandoned in a way, but that was life. Lou Perez grew up in a ghetto in Bronx. That part of New York City shaped him into a tough and rebellious kid. And while he had a Christian family background, Lou felt abandoned by his parents. He feared God to a degree, but also thought it would be easier to run from God than it would be to repent and follow him. But all that changed one day when Lou read a scary passage in the Bible, which brought him to church and became the stepping stone in the transformation of his life. I'm Helen Todd, and Lou Perez is my guest on this episode of the Limitless Spirit podcast. Today, he's a pastor, a podcaster himself, and a Bible teacher. And he shares some exciting and and really amazing stories how his changed life helped others to change. From a drug-addicted friend who ended up becoming a pastor to meeting a rejected and a lonely boy in China and making his day. Let's hear Lou's story now. Hello, Lou. So great to have you on the Limitless Spirit podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Glad to be with you and and just sharing our story today. Well, I'm excited excited to have you as a fellow podcaster. Uh, Let's talk about your podcast for a little bit. What what is the name of it? Our podcast is called Soul Zero Two, and the goal is to bring oxygen back into the Christian life one soul at a time and encourage believers and followers of Christ. But we also get likes and challenges and comments from atheists and all kinds who, because sometimes I, I talk about apologetics and things like that on the, on the podcast and, and navigating you know the age of rage that, that is happening today. But it's... Uh, soulzero2.com and we have a website and we're on we're also on on YouTube. So it's a video podcast. Do you normally uh just share yourself or you have guests on your podcast? I usually just share myself because I'm a teacher and a teacher wants to teach. But it's also an audio podcast as well. Very cool. Well, I hope our listeners check it out. Just knowing you, I I can say it's very insightful and entertaining at the same time. And speaking of this, I am excited to share your story on the Limitless Spirit podcast today because I, even though I have known you and Luisa for many years, I've known you as a pastor, as a friend, as a fellow missionary sometimes, but I didn't know Lou Perez before you mm. accepted Christ. So let's talk about that. Before I came to Christ, I was in a Christian family in that my grandfather was a pastor and we have other uncles and aunts that are evangelists and ministers. And so we always had the influence, even though we were in the ghetto and kind of tough kids. And even though we would do wrong things, we always had the fear of God in us. Like we didn't go so far because we felt compelled by the fear of God. And uh, growing up, we used to go roof hopping, you know, where you jump between buildings. And we used to hide inside furnaces uh, of abandoned buildings, which is people's parents would go crazy if their kid did that. But that's what we did because that was fun. And we used to have fights, like uh, fun fights with rocks and trash can lids as shields. And sometimes we were running from another group of people trying to beat us up and things like that. And often we would sleep on the fire escape because it was so hot in the house that we would just sleep outside the fire escape and, you know, with all the sirens and noise. And that was life. 
Well, that sounds fun, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but to give our listeners a perspective, what was the life like in a ghetto in Bronx as you were growing up? It's very tough, very poor, and little hope of the future. And when you're a minority, you're marginalized. And, and, uh, but you don't know that when you're a kid. When you're a kid, all you know is this city is, is the whole world. And we actually used to go to the zoo to see the chickens because they'd never seen a chicken or a cow. So you go to the zoo. That's how it was. And so when we first went to the country in Pennsylvania, we, we stopped just to take pictures of the cows on the road, you know. But uh, it was very difficult. And you feel like in the book of Nehemiah, where God's hand was always upon you, there's at least five times where it says God's hand was upon him. And that's how I felt. Now, many people looking at you don't realize that you're not a Caucasian because you have a fair skin, but your ancestors are actually from Puerto Rico. And so can you share about your experiences when you felt like you were treated as a minority, maybe unfairly treated? Yeah. When I first went to high school in Pennsylvania, people sometimes said remarks when they knew my nationality. But the weird part is that when you are fair-skinned and you have long black hair, because I did when I was younger, the other minorities pick on you because they think you're Caucasian. So, so I got it from all ends. It was kind of funny, <laughs> but not at the time. <laughs> so perhaps you maybe felt like you didn't belong at times. Uh, correct. My dad worked three jobs and my mom was mentally ill her whole life. So I grew up never feeling loved really. Like love was, hey, I'm paying the bills, that's love. And never affection. So you, you kind of grow up feeling abandoned in a way, but not even knowing that that you feel that way until you get older and you, and, you, and those issues come up. So you mentioned that uh, you had pastures within your heritage and, and that always had an influence on you in certain ways. At what point do you remember actually understanding that you do have a Christian heritage or, or recognizing that there is Jesus and there is God? Well, uh, since I was a boy, really, um, I knew it, but I ran away from it. And it was easier in my mind to run away from God and the consequences of having to change your life than, you know, it was easier to, to run away than, than, than to repent. I knew that, that I had to get right with God, even as a kid. So I always had the fear of the Lord in me, but sometimes God uses circumstances to stoke that fear. So how did it happen for you? For me, and this is a little comical, besides like once or twice getting beat up, you know, in, in, on the streets where you get tired of it and you're like, okay, God, I'm, I give up. I started reading the Bible by myself and that was a big deal because I'd rather be outside playing with my friends. So you just had a Bible in your house or where did you find one? Yes. Well, my mom always had a Bible. Even though she was mentally ill, she there was always a seed of faith in her. And once in a while, she would be lucid and just say these things with great wisdom that were right on. And then she would go back in, into her darkness. But she always had a Bible in the house. And so I took her Bible and started reading. And I started reading Revelation and reading about these creepy creatures in Revelation that, are, that eat people. <laughs> and I said, boy, I don't want that to happen to me, so I'm going to go to church. <laughs> so, Well, whatever can get you to church, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, but, but you learn later on uh, as, a, as a teacher now that fear can only go so far because you can't uh, scare a person into love. Love has to be the basis of our relationship. So maybe, you know, because God's so patient, he winked on that at first, but later on, it became a thing of love. That's a great point. So at first, it was fear that compelled you to church. How was it that you actually accepted, invited him into your heart? Well, I went to the Spanish Pentecostal church where my sisters were attending because they were the first ones really to come to the faith in, in my immediate family. And they would urge me on, you got to come to church and, you know, all this. And I'm like, nah, I'm good. And I used to curse like a sailor, you know, and, and cursing was like saying hello, you know, at, at, in the Bronx. And so I went to church after all this fear stuff. And the minute the pastor gave the call, I ran up there 
in my seventies clothes with the, you know, the big platform shoes and, and bell bottoms. And, and I, I got saved. I, I just interviewed someone not long ago who also had the salvation experience at a young age, probably 10, nine or 10 years old. And she said that she actually felt a change in her. Did you have a similar experience? Yes. I felt the presence of God, something that before I had felt kind of like the, the pull of God, but now I felt like he was there and that my life was about to change. So how, how did that change happen? Very gradually, because even after I got saved, like I said, I used to curse like a sailor and just had bad habits and just go out with my friends and, you know, till late at night and just come home whenever I wanted. And I was rebellious. I was selfish, self-centered, narcissistic, even at that age, you know, even at at 13. And they say that at 12, that you start thinking concretely. and, And God began challenging me about my language first, because I would say curse words like, like you say, hello. And, and how that, that didn't please him. And, and so I started changing that slowly. And really salvation is, you know, I, I see salvation as a, as a process. It's not just a single account, but salvation has, is, has four tenses, past, perfect, present, and future. And in a sense, yes, you were saved, but you're still being saved. That's why Paul said to those who, who are being saved, it's the power you know, of God. And so slowly he started changing the way that I think. And that process, I believe, will never end until his return. Great point, too, because we tend to think that salvation is that moment when you invite Jesus into your heart. But in reality, this is just the beginning of a process that is ongoing. So that is a very good point. So in what ways do you feel like God directed your steps? Because your life could have turned very differently had you not made that decision of accepting him growing up under the influence that you did. So what? how do you feel God directed your path to bring you where you are today, a pastor, a Bible teacher, a podcaster? Well, almost immediately, I, I wanted to preach. And I heard of a man who had gotten saved, and within eight hours of being saved, he was preaching the gospel on the streets. And I said to myself, wow, he didn't have to go to Bible school or anything, even though I did, but God can work with you at any time in any way he wants. And so I would listen to like R.W. Schambach on the radio or Robert Schuller, which are extreme differences, you know, theologically and, and even style-wise, but I just loved communication and Billy Graham, of course, was a great, and different people like that, and like Bishop Fulton Sheen, the great Catholic bishop. And I began learning not just how to preach, but how to communicate, how, how, to, how to talk to people. And as the world was changing, of course, you don't know it when you're young and in those days, but it was becoming more postmodern, which means that when you preach to the average person, they, they, they may not necessarily believe in absolute truth anymore. And so all that was changing, and God was teaching me how to navigate that and how to speak to people, not preach at them, and how to, how what fuels prayer, what fuels preaching is prayer. And so for a long season, I was praying maybe two hours a day or more. Even as a young person, I, was, I, I would pray a long time and just spend time with God, and I would fast and all these things. And, and I was always hungry for God. And no one ever taught me this. I kind of learned that on my own, you know, just the hard way. And and slowly but surely, my pastor in Pennsylvania said, you know, God's already called you, but I think you're waiting for him to knock you on the head and tell you to go. So I think you should go to Bible college. So I went to Valley Forge. At that time, I was Valley Forge Christian College. Now it's it's a university. And, and I got my bachelor's in science and Bible. And then I, after that, I was an evangelist for like three or four years and traveled all over the country and had a blast doing that. And then a church called me and said, we want you to come and be our pastor. And I felt like God was releasing me to do it. And this was a place called Schenectady in New York, which is near Albany. That church had had five pastors in 10 years. And so when I got there, people were looking at me like fresh meat for the grinder, you know? <laughs> and God told me he was going to do a great work there. And we had about... 50 people at the time. And, and God began to move in a mighty way. And, and revival really happened in, in, in the sense that every week people were being transformed and people were you know coming to Christ. And I would confront people in love and I would say, look, 
you've been attending this church 30 years, but do you know God? Do you really know God? Do you know him? Do you walk with him? And there were people that they wanted to become members. And I'm like, you know, I, I would interview each member, myself and some other leaders. And often we felt they weren't ready for membership, even though they were thoroughly indoctrinated with, with the knowledge of the church because they didn't really know God. They didn't, God didn't have a grasp on them. And so, so this was the kind of message that God birthed in my heart of transforming people so that they can know God. So that church grew to probably over 300 in time. And, and then we went after that to Niagara Falls and, and took a church there and then started another church after that. And so that, that, that's the short version. Got my master's degree in the, in the middle somewhere. And that's the short version of it. So I know you got your theological education, but do you feel like growing up where you did in a ghetto in Bronx sort of prepared you for being a shepherd, a leader, a spiritual leader, because it perhaps gave you more insight and compassion into people's struggles? Well, yes, in the sense that the city toughens you up and gives you a certain kind of temperament, which sometimes it can be good, sometimes it can be bad, because sometimes my wife will look at me and say, stop talking to me like I'm Robert De Niro, like you're Robert De Niro. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and I have to tone it down. I have to say, okay, I'm sorry, honey. Because that's because uh, Robert De Niro is from the Bronx, and the Bronx have a certain way that they communicate that can be tough because you kind of grow up on your knuckles. But in some ways, it probably did prepare me in ways I don't even realize that, you know, to shepherd and to teach. But what also prepared me besides, besides the city was simply spending long seasons in the backside of a spiritual desert. Very true. Uh, well, you know, when we experience that change within us from Christ, and for you it happened at a young age, but it, this is what compels us to help others experience the same. And I'm sure as a pastor, as a spiritual leader, you probably had many occasions when you helped someone else to experience that transformation. Is there a story that is the most memorable perhaps for you? There are quite a few, but I could only give you a couple. One of them is a, a very successful pastor, pastor of the Church of Pennsylvania of probably a thousand people. And I had forgotten this, but I saw him recently because we went to high school together and he was like the main druggy guy. And he was like on the wrestling team and he was very tough, but he, he also had like a drug life and party life. And he told me that he said, when I saw him recently, he said, you know, I'm a pastor because of you, because you, you witnessed to me when I was 17. And then the Lord dealt with my heart and, you know, brought me to him. And then other people like that, that, that are in the ministry because- I connected with them some way that I probably even forgot, didn't even realize. We've had people who want to commit suicide that maybe we made a connection and, and they're on the right path now, or people who just wanted to quit the ministry. And we got, we got a chance to speak into their life and, and give them hope and, and raise them up and, and just uh, validate them and, and strengthen them. But there are quite a few. So this pastor that you ministered to at the age of 17, and you were probably about the same age at the time. Do you remember how that happened? Because my understanding is you were in a pretty tough um, school that was known for the fights among the boys. So yes. Probably, maybe in some ways, even a dangerous environment. So how how did that happen that you decided to witness to a druggie <laughs> and and probably a violent guy in some ways? This was right after I left the, the large school. It was, had 5,000 boys. It was called DeWitt Clinton. And like a lot of famous actors came out of there. But I went I went there for two years. And then, then I went to a school in Pennsylvania for two years. And the school in Pennsylvania was, was the one that I was the only Latin one in there. So it was really weird. And that's where I found this, I met this man, but I don't remember the conversation. That's the funny part, but only that it happened, you know, because he, he told me. And and so he's a great pastor now, great guy. Probably wasn't a big deal for you, but surely was a big deal for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never know, you know, when, when Jesus talks about being salt and light, it, it's more than words. It's It's literally broadcasting who you are. It's letting God refract his light through your life. 
And that's what, in, in my humble opinion, being a witness is, that it's it's more than words. It's letting the imago Dei, the image of God, right, in, in Hebrew, refract through your life into someone else. And that's how they get it most of the time. Because I, I, I believe, you know, I, I believe in apologetics. However, apologetics are very limited because you can probably talk anyone out of an argument and debate anybody, but it's not the same as broadcasting your heart. And this is why it's, it's, it's so wonderful that anybody can do this without being an apologist. I couldn't agree with you more because so many times on the mission field, our biggest impact that we made was not through the sermons that we preached or teaching that we presented, but it was just through some small insignificant acts in everyday life. I remember, and by the way, one of the mission trips that you went with us was to China, and I want us to talk about that in a little bit, but it was actually in China. We were eating at a restaurant with the team, just, you know, time of fellowship, food, joking around with each other, and the a group of waiters called our interpreter aside, and they asked her, who are these people? There is something so special and different about them, the way they treat each other, the way they treat us. And so our interpreter was able to tell them, well, they are Christians, they're, they're missionaries, and they share about their faith and about Christ. And that so intrigued that group of waiters that they wanted to hear more about who is this Christ and what kind of faith do they practice. And we actually ended up giving Bibles to the whole staff at the restaurant. So this whole ministry opportunity came about because they observed something different in the way we treated each other. And to me, that was the greatest compliment I have ever heard on the mission field. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there's a beautiful scripture that says, Revelations 12, 11, that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And I, I'm glad it, it doesn't say that they overcame him by by the word of their apologists, you know, being an apologist, because anybody can give a testimony. And I'm sure you've heard the saying that the person with experience will never be at the mercy with the person with the argument, because they can never take away what God did for you. And that is very, very true. So let's talk about your mission trip experience. So as a pastor and and a, t- a Bible teacher, you have a very certain knowledge of what your calling is. And going on a mission trip sort of is a different, you know, a different experience. Was it tough for you to even make a decision to go or was it a natural thing for you? I'll put it to you this way. At the time I went, I went to China... I had a free trip that was paid for to go to Israel by this organization. And I felt like God said, I want you to go to China instead. So I, I, I forewent, <laughs> I forego the, the trip to Israel. I went to China because I felt like Israel would have been great and nice to be there, and but I'm more receiving there than giving. And I felt like I needed to give. So it was a no-brainer for me to go. And God didn't have to really twist my arm to go. I just knew that I needed to go. And, and there are times where I know when I when I shouldn't go or, or don't need to go, but that's something you have to pray about and really find God's heart. And so what were maybe some of the most memorable experiences? I didn't know that, by the way, that you actually passed a fully paid trip to Israel. But, you know, now thinking back and considering that the situation in China has changed since that time significantly, and I'm not quite sure when we'll be able to go back to China. For sure, this was uh, truly God's timing and will. So let's talk about what impacted you the most on that trip. It was so much. I mean, I really had great fellowship with the team and with your husband, Chuck. He was a great guy. He has an infectious laugh. And I'm sure you probably don't feel like that all the time, but (laughs) I thought it was great. But what really touched me was the reverence that the Chinese have for the word and the hunger they have for the word. In Western culture, we are plagued by consumerism. And in consumerism, God becomes nothing more than a commodity that we just kind of, you know, we commodify him and just say, well, let me just take in a a video and that'll be my church. But in Asian cultures, Oriental cultures, they there's such a reverence for God that when they're when they worship, they give themselves fully to it. It's not something they consume, but it's something that they look at and say, God is consuming me because I'm giving him worship. 
And that's, that's something that burns in my heart for America, that America would return to that kind of worship, because churches have often become more of a stage than an altar. And other things impacted me on that trip, too. Like when I had my best meal at a Teen Challenge type facility that where they, they got the fish f- from a pond on the outside. Oh, the drug rehab. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That was the best food I got in China. And it was amazing. It was humble. And there was a hunger and attentive, attentiveness to what any, everyone said, you know, not just the leaders, but everyone. I recall speaking 15 times in six days, I think, because there was a lot to do. And it was exciting. And one that I, that I recall was more of a tragic event, but it's something that the Lord is always for the outcast. And we went to the house of a boy who was uh, crippled. And in, in, the, in the Asian culture, you know, whenever you go to the bathrooms, instead of saying, uh, you know, handicapped, it says deformed, in, in, at least where I, where I was. And so imagine this boy, he's probably 10 years old, and the whole world around him sees him as deformed, like something's wrong with you. And his own father had rejected him. So we went to visit him just to encourage him. And someone had given me a beautiful gift. One of the interpreters gave me a beautiful gift. So I brought that gift to give it to the boy. And he was just crying. And we prayed with him and we told him God is his father. God loves him. And so, you know, those are, those are things that really blessed me and impacted me in that sense that because, again, when you contrast it to Western culture, in Western culture, religion and Christianity is is often seen as just something like, okay, you know, I have my, my mechanic here, my doctor here, and my church here. And it's not seen as as the answer to your life, that, that your whole life revolves around in a sense. And so that's the contrast I saw there because I think of, of the culture that is there uh, that is difficult and challenging. And I believe that maybe that has to happen here, that some kind of suffering has to happen here for Christians maybe to get back to where they need to be. And perhaps you're right. And you know, when you were sharing the story of visiting that handicapped boy, I was thinking there was a moment in your life when you felt like no one loved you and you felt like you were forgotten by the world and God appeared in your life and changed it all. And then years later, you come to a boy who feels unloved and forgotten and you bring him this gift and who knows what kind of transformation that brought to his life. You may never see this boy again on this earth, but I will not be surprised, Lou, if in eternity, this boy will walk up to you someday and say, I'm here because of you. And that would be the greatest blessing I would ever receive in in this world and in eternity. And how wonderful it is that you truly listened to God's voice and went when he compelled you to go, because it is it is hard to overestimate the impact of just a simple act of kindness. And, I, and I'm sure you touched many lives while you were in China, but I this is the first time I hear the story of the boy that you visited, and I feel like perhaps that was the assignment for which God called you on that particular trip. Perhaps. Um, I do believe that God, that sometimes th- there's one specific assignment within the assignment, you know, that that is primary. Not that, I, not that the other things are unimportant, but I hear exactly what you're saying and agree 100%. Well, thank you so much, Lou, for uh, coming on the podcast, sharing your story. I feel like I have gotten to know you better. And that's after all these years of already knowing you. <laughs> So I really appreciate you. I hope that our listeners will check out your podcast. Why don't you mention that website again? Soul02.com. And I will also put it in the show, put the link in the show notes so that they can easily click on it and check it out. Well, thank you again and many blessings to you. Thank you, Helen. It's been a pleasure. There is a place for you on the mission field. You have a story that you can share with someone and shine the light of Christ into their life. If living out the Great Commission is on your heart and you want to find out more how to become involved, how to get connected with World Missions Alliance, please visit our website, rfwma.org. 
If you enjoyed hearing from Lou Perez and want to know more about Lou, I do encourage you to check out his podcast. And as I mentioned uh, in the interview, we have a link to it in the show notes. So you can click on it and go directly to it. Until next time, I'm Helen Todd, and I hope you have a blessed day. Limitless Spirit is produced by World Missions Alliance. If you believe in the importance of the Great Commission, sharing Christ around the world and helping those in need, check out our website, rfwma.org. If you liked what you heard, consider supporting the Limitless Spirit podcast by going to rfwma.org slash give. Subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform and leave us a review. Tune in next week for another exciting episode.